The text for our sermon this first Sunday after the Epiphany is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let us pray. O oh, Almighty God, eternal life is that your disciples would know you, the only true God, and he whom you sent, Jesus Christ. Through his teaching and through the preaching of your holy word, may we know you and may we grow in faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. Saints of God, holy and dearly loved, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The baptism of Jesus Christ is the starting point. It is what triggers Jesus' ministry. He's baptized, and then he's off and running. After his baptism, God the Father declared, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And Jesus begins his ministry with this in mind. He, he begins with God the Father saying, Who's Jesus? He's my son. But people look back on Jesus and on his ministry, and they're not satisfied by what God himself said about Jesus. People have continued to give their own ideas, to say what their opinion is, to say, well, this is my answer. At Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked this question to his disciples. Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And you, who do you say that I am? He asked them. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the answer that God the Father had revealed to him through the teaching of Jesus. He had the answer. C.S. Lewis, author, professor of English literature, and one of the primary uh, apologists, one of the great defenders of the Christian faith of the, over the last century, said that Jesus is either a liar, a crazy man, or he's the Lord. Being that he claims to be the Lord, those are our choices. Jesus claims to be the truth. So if he's lying to us, we can't accept anything that he says, either about death or life or morality. If Jesus is a liar, we must reject everything he teaches. And we can't trust him. If Jesus is crazy, we can't consider him as a good teacher, a rabbi, a guru. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, If Christ is not risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. If it's only for this life that we hope in Christ, then we are the most to be pitied of all men. If we're following the teachings of a crazy man, what does that say about us? That we're crazy too. 
But if Jesus is God, if he is the Lord, if he's the son of the Father, if he is God in human flesh, we must listen to him, learn from him, trust in his promises. We have good reason to believe that he is the Lord. First off, the Old Testament prophets predicted his coming and what he would accomplish. He did miracles that no one has ever seen before or since. He said that he would suffer and die, be buried and be raised from the dead on the third day, as the scriptures say. And this is the testimony that we have received from the apostles, who said it would be better to die than to deny he who they knew to be God. God created us in his image. Our sinful flesh wants to make a God in our image. To, to shape and to fashion an idol that we can call Jesus. But if it doesn't look like the Jesus that is in scripture, we've created our own Jesus. And we miss the true Jesus that is revealed in scripture. If we want to know the true Jesus, God introduces us to him through his word. When we read the word, our starting point is never to say, ah, this is what I think Jesus is like. And then to try and fit Jesus into our categories. It's rather to start with the word and say, who is the Jesus that God is revealing to me in this word? For example, at Christmas, we've heard that God became man. The word became flesh. That is the Jesus in that text. Those for Epiphany that we celebrated a couple of days ago were that Jesus, this man, is more than a man, that he is God. And throughout this season of Epiphany, as we think about the coming of the wise men, the tradition is here in France to eat galette des rois, these cakes with uh, apple or, or um, marzipan inside. But really, for Epiphany, our focus isn't on these wise men, but the child that they were looking for. We read that they entered into the house and saw this little child with Mary, his mother, and bowed down and worshipped him. And there we find the Jesus in the text. The child that they found is the Lord that they worshipped. The Jesus that we meet in Epiphany is the man who did what only God could do. In chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah, we hear a, a prediction about the servant of the Lord. The people of Israel thought that the prophet was speaking about them. But as you go on and reading through Isaiah, you realize it's not about the nation, but about the Messiah. And God speaks about him. This is my servant, the one that I will sustain. Him whom I have chosen, who has full, my full approval. I have put my spirit on him, and he will reveal what is right to the nations. That's why John objected to this idea of him baptizing Jesus. There he was, face to face with the Messiah, and the Messiah wanted to be baptized by him? Think about it. What was John's baptism about? It was a baptism of repentance. It was calling people to turn from their sin. Do you see the problem with that? Jesus had no sin. He did everything the law required. Jesus didn't need to be baptized by John. He didn't need to repent. He always did and wanted to do the will of God the Father. But Jesus answers to John, let it be so, for it is necessary to fulfill 
all righteousness. And Jesus did exactly that. He did everything that was required to fulfill all righteousness. So when we read what Isaiah said and described about this suffering servant of the Lord, we see the Spirit of God descend on Jesus as a dove. Jesus has God's approval. And we hear the voice of God the Father. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. The Jesus that our text presents to us is the servant of God, the one prophesied in Isaiah 40, who accomplishes the salvation of the nations, who accomplishes your salvation, who obeyed all of God's law, and who credits it all to you. John realized that he needed to be baptized by Jesus. We're in the same boat. We need to be baptized by Jesus. But we receive what John the Baptist never got. Jesus baptizes you. Yes, Jesus baptizes you. He does it through an intermediary who pours the water, who speaks the word, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But it is Jesus who acts. Just like the baptism of John, Jesus' baptism is a baptism of repentance. We know that our old sinful man has to be crucified with him so that this body of sin might be brought to nothing and so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For truly, he who is dead is free from sin. So as a child of God, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Worship isn't just what happens on Sunday morning. Your daily worship isn't just reading a meditation or listening to um, uh, uh, somebody speak some words. Your entire life becomes worship. When you don't conform to the will of this world, but when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind to be able to discern the good and pleasing will of God. The baptism of Jesus is more than John's baptism. Jesus offers you gifts, the gifts of God in your baptism. Forgiveness, life, salvation. You become sons or daughters of God, inheritors of the kingdom of God. You receive the Holy Spirit. You receive faith. You are clothed in Christ and in his righteousness. The baptism into Jesus accounts to you all of Jesus' obedience to the law. His innocent death his resurrection from the dead, eternal life. Jesus takes your sins and he gives you his innocence. And so you hear this word of God the Father. You hear this word of God the Father. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. That is what you receive in your baptism. Jesus isn't a liar. He's not crazy. He is the Lord who baptized you, who himself was baptized, to accomplish all righteousness. He is the Lord. He is the servant of the Lord. But he also comes to serve you all that you need in the waters of your baptism. During this season of Epiphany, the Jesus that you will encounter in the Word is more than just a man, more than just a good teacher, more than a guru. He is the Lord. He is God, the one the wise men praised, the Lord that we worship here as ones who are baptized into Christ. Oh yes, we celebrate Epiphany not to receive a crown that is corruptible, but to receive a crown 
that will never uh, uh, fade. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, concludes with the crowning of the uh, Penisive kids, Aslan, who reminds us of Jesus, who died to save Edmund, who won the victory, who freed all of Narnia from that which is evil. And finally, all of the children, Edmund included, take their places on thrones that had been prepared for them. And Aslan says, once a king or a queen in Narnia, always a queen or a king in Narnia. Be worthy, sons of Adam. Be worthy, daughters of Eve. Dear saints, you are kings and queens in the kingdom of Christ. Jesus says to you, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, and you will be throned with him for all eternity. Who is this Jesus? The one God the Father answers. He gives the answer and he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds steadfast in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.